Cerebral, how do you say that? I actually don't know. I want to say that correctly. Cerebral palsy. Okay, I learned how to say it. Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel and today we're going to be doing a two-ish three-month wrap-up. So here we go. I would have done this a lot sooner except for the fact that I was on vacation, as you all know, and I can't do anything while I'm on vacation apparently, <laughs> so sorry for the wait. All the way back in August, uh, I had a reading slow because I figured I was going to be doing a lot for Monsterthon in September, so I was just sort of giving myself a break before ramping up to doing a lot of reading, at least for me. So uh, August, I started out with a Darker Shade of Magic. Um, I've only read uh, one V.E. Schwab book before. I was very happy that this book held up to my expectations. I gave it five stars, as you can see. For those of you who don't know, this book is about Kel, who is a particular type of magician called an Antari. He is able to travel between dimensions, um, so he travels between uh, three or four different Londons, which he has designated by color, and he travels between the different Londons to deliver letters between the respective rulers who all keep in touch with each other. But of course, it can't be just as simple as that. He is uh, approached by someone to return a magical item back to a London that has been supposedly sealed off because the magic has overtaken and corrupted everything. This was a really fun entrance into this world. I was very happy and excited, as I keep saying. Definitely would recommend, highly recommend actually, to anybody who just really enjoys fantasy. Next, I read God's Grave, which I gave four stars. I wasn't really sure where this one was going at first. I, I read this for the read-along that Rich Maria was hosting. Uh, I actually appeared on the live show for the Nevernight one, so I was really happy for that opportunity, and I wanted to continue with that, so I read God's Grave. Again, this was not what I was really expecting. I was sort of expecting more of this sort of assassin, maybe not the school necessarily, but more more that end of the spectrum of this world, and for this one, it was a gladiator story. We still have Mia as our protagonist, and she still has the same goal, she still wants to kill the people who killed her father, but it it took place through the scope of gladiators, really, of, of slate enslaved fighters. So that was a really interesting turn. I enjoyed the, uh, the sapphic romance that happened. It was very interesting, it felt right, it felt good. Um, the writing, as always, was, was wonderful, but for whatever reason, I didn't feel like it was a five-star read for me. I think it was just because we switched gears so hard that I I don't know if I was quite on board with it before I sort of gave up and said okay we're 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 going with this. Would I recommend? Absolutely. Absolutely if you if you finish Nevernight and you want to continue like God's Grave was excellent. Um, it just wasn't a five-star read for me. That doesn't mean that it was bad. So that was it for August. Now we get into September, which was the Monsterathon, hosted by and created by Chapter Kate. This was really fun. I I read a lot of books. I've read. I think I read more books in this month because of this readathon than I have any other month total. And like n these were not small books either. So I, I was very impressed with myself. I was very happy. So let's get started. First one was Infidel. And I, I keep talking about this in other videos because it it really was that good. Um, five stars. Uh, definitely would recommend. Like, please pick this up. I hope that this is going to be the first in a series. It was horror that dealt with racism and Islamophobia specifically, and even sort of like we talked very very lightly about internalized racism, internalized Islamophobia. It it doesn't go very deep. It, it's a very wide but shallow ocean. But even the fact that we get little hints of it throughout the book is is really amazing. Like, I don't think I've seen anything else do it quite like Infidel. And, and of course, this is in a horror scope, so we still have a lot of blood and gore. Like, if you don't like the blood and guts and body horror, um, this is probably won't be for you. But if that is your thing or you can handle it, like, this, this is absolutely a book that I think that a lot of people should read, if only for sort of like thought pieces, thought points. It shines light at different angles so that you can then think through and start to sort of judge more or less depending on how you want to approach this. It, it was really good. I'm gonna stop talking about this now. I could go on about this forever. And the next one was Dracula. And if you didn't see my vlog, 
<laughs> I had such a hard time with this. This one was probably the one that I just, I slogged through. It was so, so long. And I kind of knew that this was gonna be the challenging one, so that's the reason why I read it quite early. I probably should have just pushed it toward the end because I, I was feeling real bad after this. But anyway, I gave it three stars. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't good. If I never read Dracula ever again in my life, I, I don't think I'd care. I am glad that I got to read it though. I feel like I sort of wasted my time, but at the end of the day, I am grateful that I did. Just because there are little interesting bits and pieces that I observed in the literature, even just for a, a historical reference, because this is written in a, a Victorian lens, so um, certain things between genders is really interesting. Between classes, this kind of pseudoscience that embeds itself into the language. I mentioned this in my vlog. Apparently Van Helsing has amazingly bushy, thick eyebrows. And there's a couple people who say like, a man with his eyebrows couldn't possibly understand the, the feeling of, you know, grief and mor like mourning that these other characters who don't have as fabulous eyebrows uh, apparently do. And I, I kept thinking about it like, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous, but I think that the bushy eyebrows was just like a sign of manliness or something like masculinity, maleness, blah 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 blah, and so that was a that was a cultural shortcut for the readers of the time to understand that Van Helsing was a strong character. And you know how I feel about shortcuts. If you don't, go watch the video. But it's an interesting cultural context. I'm I'm fascinated. I I really enjoyed that, even though I was laughing my ass off through all the eyebrow parts. I wish it had been a little bit faster. I was reading it at like two times speed and it still wasn't going fast enough. So three stars. Would I recommend only only if you are dying to read it or you really enjoy uh, books that are written entirely through diary entries. I, I think that if you really wanted to like get the story of Dracula without having to read it or listen to the audiobook or any such thing, this version of Dracula, I can't remember the director, but this one I think it was made in like 92 or 93. I've watched this before. I read the book, and this is a pretty accurate movie portrayal. Obviously, you, it's never going to be quite the same, but if you want the gist without all the slowness, this is it. Next was Circle of Shadows, and I got it in a scribbler box, and it had been sitting on my shelf. I also had it on script, so I got to read it physically and also listen to it while I was doing other things. This was the single worst read of the readathon. And that's saying something coming off of Dracula that I gave it two stars. Circle of Shadows is about, I guess they're technically like a police force. Um, they are called taigas. These taigas are always put in pairs and they're called like Gemini pairs. I don't know how they're bonded, but they are in some way, shape, or form. Several years ago, there was a fight between the royal members of the family, a um, brother and sister. The sister won out being the rightful ruler of this island, and the brother was uh, banished and or killed. I can't remember at this point. So there's a graduating class that is kind of silly. They, they like to pull lots of pranks. They ask for forgiveness rather than permission kind of deal. And they find out that there is an elite force called Ryu, like dragon and they have a different kind of magic than was previously thought to exist and they are there to sort of take over the island for the dead prince who has now miraculously been found to have survived apparently no one in this land believes these graduates because you know they're young and obviously they don't know their own minds and shit yeah that's kind of the premise this is a confused world. I think that if you want to turn off your brain and not care too much about what you're reading and you want an Asian inspired world, then I could recommend this to you, but I wouldn't recommend it just because I liked it. I said, the world is confused. There are characters that have really, really Asian names or really specifically Japanese names, and apparently all the food and some of the cultural contexts are grounded in Japanese culture. I've looked it up a little bit, but also some of the characters are named things like demon and fairy. I don't know. Some of the world was very Asian and it felt very Asian to me. And then there were other parts that were just purely like Western high fantasy that didn't work 
either. The magic system was not very well used and I don't feel like it was very well developed or defined. There were a lot of things about this book that just didn't connect. And I was like, okay, maybe this is a debut novel because I, I could see some, some of those things just sort of being, okay, she, she doesn't have experience. Um, but this is her third novel. I will not be continuing with the series. It was entertaining, but I wish that there had been a little bit more cohesive bonds between a lot of the particular elements that she was trying to play with. And also, I really kind of wish that this had not been put in a like a Japanese or an Asian setting because it didn't work, it didn't land. It, it felt like it was diverse just to be diverse and that is a horrible thing to say considering we need representation and I don't think that we as writers, we as a sort of reading consciousness have figured out that perfect blend between the English language and American audiences and Asian inspired worlds or Asian worlds. There's something that just isn't connecting and I don't know what it is. I want to read more books like this and try to study it a little bit more to avoid these mistakes and perhaps to do a video on it. Um, I did ask people on Twitter for to give me their recommendations. More of like Asian fantasy world rather than uh, historic fiction because historic fiction is our real world. Jade from Jaded Reader gave me a ton of different recommendations. If you have some recommendations, please leave them in the comments below because I'm going to dedicate to this pretty hard in the near future. Uh, it's NaNoWriMo, so not quite yet, but I will be in the future. Uh, next was Pet Cemetery, <laughs> and this is the first Stephen King novel that I've ever read, so this was really interesting. I want to watch the remake movie that just came out. That'll be really interesting to see how that holds up, if it is actually scary. And uh, yeah, I gave this four stars. I don't know, it, it, was, it was interesting because like I knew where it was going, especially toward the end. I don't want to say it was predictable, but it very much funneled you into this train of thought and I think that was the point so obviously you kind of knew the ending to this book. Pet Cemetery is about a doctor who has uprooted his entire family and he is going to be the doctor for uh, the local university. He has bought a beautiful house and that has a lot of land. Sort of in the back of their land is the Pet Cemetery and beyond the pet cemetery is uh, haunted Indian land, I think maybe is the best way to describe that, even though that's like that, that's not a very good term, but that's kind of the way that it's uh, presented. The land has been either blessed or cursed by the Native American gods, I guess is how that is explained. And if you bury a thing there, that has died a traumatic death, then uh, it may come back, but not quite the same as it was. You make the logic leap, well, if we can do this with animals, then maybe we can do this with humans. And there are a lot of stories like that are told within this context. Uh, obviously, we do have a main character who's sort of finding out about this and is kind of going mad, is kind of how I took it. He's racked by these thoughts of how this works and why this works and how can we push the limits of this particular power um, and lots of tragedy strikes. I was not scared necessarily. I was very creeped out um, except for one part in which everything is perfect. If you've read the book you kind of know what I'm talking about. This, this moment where I guess it's like a daydream where you know we the main character has projected into the future and you know his his kids are grown up and successful and has you know they've married and had families and like that was the most horrific part of the entire book for me i was very surprised at how horrible i felt listening to this very normal and wonderful life it was weird I, I really enjoyed it. But unfortunately, I did not give it five stars because it was a little too predictable. It did go on very long in some places, and it was a lot of sit down by my campfire and listen to this creepy tale. I understood why structurally those things had to happen, but they stopped being creepy after a while and they started being kind of annoying. Would I recommend this? Uh, sure, why not? Like, it wasn't a bad read. It was a very entertaining read. It was uh, great going into the spooptober season. So yeah, sure. Next was A Natural History of Dragons, which I gave five stars to. This was amazing. I didn't really quite know what to expect, but 
this was great. A Natural History of Dragons, for those of you who don't know, is about uh, Lady Trent, who is our main character, and she's telling this in the form of a memoir. As she's telling it, this, she's an old lady who has lived her life and has no more fucks to give, she's not going to impress anyone anymore, and she's gonna tell this story like it was. In this first novel, we get to find out sort of her origin, like she's always been interested in dragons and she always wanted to study them, but of course because she was living in a Victorian-esque society, women only got up to a certain level of education and they were not scientists, it was very difficult for them to be beyond the role of mother, housekeeper, you know, lady of the manor as it were. But she, she manages it and, you know, through sort of sneaky means. She definitely strikes me as a, a Slytherin. She gets to go on this amazing adventure and study dragons. She does suffer a lot of loss and she does have a lot of cultural clashes that happen and I don't even care that some of the language and some of the views that she had on the, the local peoples that you know of the place that she was studying were kind are, are kind of problematic. It's done in such a way that if this was real, if this was an actual memoir, this is how that generation would have looked at the cultural differences and the different people, just the lack of certain norms and niceties that they were used to in, I guess, which would have been England. It's a very interesting thing to observe, but also sort of understand that this isn't right. It added to my enjoyment of the the book, even through its problematic language, because it was almost purposely problematic. She's not a bad person. She's a person. Like, she she has flaws. And I, I appreciate that. I, I really enjoyed it. It really made me wish that dragons were real, and this was a world that I I lived in. It was, it was, quite, it was very nice. I want to finish the rest. Definitely recommend like if you like any sort of fantasy i think this is this is a book for you next that i read was the subtle art of not giving a fuck and i gave this three stars i could see how this could help some people a lot of people who grew up in a certain environment who grew up with certain values who in this modern day and age feel like they need to keep up with the joneses as it were that being said i didn't get anything out of this and if anything, it just sort of confirmed my my upbringing. He took a lot of different stories and adages from Buddhism, which I grew up Buddhist. I guess what I'm saying is the subtle, the subtle art of not giving a fuck is Buddhist. And I, I, I think this, this self-help book definitely helps if you have trouble letting things go and letting things be as they're going to be and you need help figuring out what to actually care about in your life even if you just need sort of like a, a reminder that it's okay to not care about certain things i think this is the book for for you i don't know if i would recommend that everyone needs to read this and i could definitely see just by the, the tone and the language that was used, why this was DNF'd or unhauled by other people. That was the prompt was, you know, find a, a book that was unhauled. I did finish it. I don't know if I'll ever read anything by this guy ever again. I gave it a good shot. Three stars isn't bad. It just, I don't think it was, it, I don't think it was written for me. Next was Frankenstein and I gave this four stars. I liked this a lot more than I thought I would. I was very surprised by it. If you don't know the story, it is about a man who is driven by his work so far that he accidentally sort of creates life. And when he does it, he doesn't quite know what to do with it. The monster is abandoned and has to sort of learn and fend for himself. And in a very clear way, wants revenge for this and wants companionship and love and, you know, adoration. Really basic human wants, but of course, because he is so hideous and he's done monstrous deeds, Dr. Frankenstein cannot give it to his creature. The creature vows revenge and chases him to the ends of the earth in order to get it. I was very surprised at how much I liked it. It also did sort of drool on in a few spots where literally the monster just sits him down, come by my campfire and listen to my story. <laughs> but at the same time, it was very good. I, like, I, I'd always felt like there was a message of parenthood and especially child abandonment and what it means to, to be a human being. And all those themes definitely came out in, in ways that I expected, but I liked that a lot. If 
you are not a fan of the Victorian language or late Victorian-esque writing, honestly, I would say try to find a recording or buy a recording of the National Theatre live. Again, I can't remember the director, but it this one, this one. And this one is very true to the book. Go do that thing. I ended up giving it four stars. Would I recommend it? I think I would which I don't think that I would normally say for older writing, but I think I would definitely recommend this. It, it has modern enough language where people won't be too bored. The audiobook that I re that I listened to was very good. It had a very great pace and uh, it, it's not too long. It, it has some slow parts, but it, it's not long. It gets kind of to the point at every turn, so. I liked it. Next was Hunting Annabelle, which I gave four stars. This is, I would say, my first real thriller. Sharp Objects was definitely a thriller, but I feel like it had a very different tone and purpose to it. This was a straight thriller. Again, I got this in a scribbler box. It is about a college-age boy who has, uh, I believe it's the synesthesia. He has synesthesia, and he also is on medication for, um, I'm not quite sure what disorder he has, but he was institutionalized at one point for, I think, killing a girl. This is in, I think, the early 80s, and they didn't really have as good of a, an understanding of, of mental illness and how that affects people as they do now, which it actually lends to this book's benefit a lot. There's a lot of problems that I don't think that you could get away with if it was written in a modern day setting, but definitely it feels like it's correct in this world. He kind of falls in love with this girl. She's very pretty and she's a little... she has a couple screws loose, like she's a little crazy, but the kind of crazy that makes her fun and interesting rather than uh, a killer. He has an episode where he loses time and when he sort of comes out of it, he hears her screaming and she's being dragged away and driven off by this truck. But unfortunately, because of his history and because of his mental illness, when he calls the cops to report that she's been kidnapped, they first off don't believe him, and then second off, when she does actually turn up that she is missing, um, he's suspect number one. He loves her and he's infatuated by her with her so much that he goes on not quite killing Rampage um, to try and find her and the twist at the end I was not even prepared for. I didn't know what happened. I thought I perhaps skipped a ton of pages. No. Yeah, that, that twist happened and it was excellent. Would I recommend Hunting Annabelle? Uh, I, I think I would, actually. It's a very fast read. Um, it, it's only, I think it's less than 300 pages, so you get there pretty quickly, it moves very fast, it creeps you out just enough, it keeps, your, keeps you on the edge of your seat the entire time. It's a great thriller. All right, the next one that I read was Bird Box, and Bird Box was a three-star read for me. I did watch the movie earlier this year, I want to say like January-ish. Unlike a lot of people, I truly enjoyed Bird Box as a sort of character piece. It had horror elements to it, but I definitely would not call this like something that was supposed to scare me, really. The monsters in this are more of the human kind than the demon kind. Both in the book and the movie, the monsters in Bird Box don't have a face, they don't have a name, they, they're sort of this nebulous presence of madness and chaos. Not quite sure how I feel about that. I do enjoy the fact that M Mallory and the, the characters themselves are not allowed to see, because if they see the madness, then they are consumed by the madness. And it, it's an interesting concept that plays out in a very different way than it does the movie and the the book. In the movie, Mallory is a very self-assured sort of like badass character. In the book, she this is this is kind of her journey to becoming that badass character. She's quite timid and unsure of herself for most of it. And I'm okay with that kind of uh, character growth and arc. It felt kind of like a lackluster book to me. It had thriller elements, it had horror elements, and they worked very well together. But if it wasn't for the fact that like I'd already seen the movie, First, I don't know if I would have picked this up, and I don't know how I would have, how well I would have enjoyed it without having seen or having, you know, planned to see the movie. Would I recommend this? If you are a thriller fan, if you liked the movie, I definitely think that this is a great way to sort of have context for a lot of the things that happen in the movie, and it, it does have some very interesting points, but 
if you are not a fan of those things or don't are not curious about them, I, I don't think that I would recommend this for you. The last one that I read for the Monsterathon was A Curse of Dark and Lonely, and I don't know what took me so long <laughs> to actually get this. I was kind of hoping for an audiobook, but I did not find one, so I ended up reading this on my Kindle. I felt like it was a fast read. Uh, it is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Let's see, did I give it? I gave it four stars. It is a lot better than <laughs> uh, Beauty and the Beast, to be honest. There is a curse. He does transform into a horrible, monstrous entity that ravages the villagers and the countryside, and the Belle character, a very strong, self-assured girl with cerebral palsy. How do you say that? I actually don't know. I want to say that correctly. Cerebral palsy. Okay, I learned how to say it. Apparently she has a very sort of mild case of it. Even though it is definitely part of her identity, I wouldn't say that that is the focus of her character. It just is a fact of life. Actually, I really enjoyed that. I like when my representation in my books, regardless of what representation that is, is not like shoved in my face and sort of like, this is my identity. It is part of who they are and you can't deny that, but it doesn't, it, it's not the whole of who they are. It, it's not a caricature of that facet of their life. For most of this, I didn't focus on the fact that she had a disability. And I I really appreciated that when it was a hindrance or when it was important, I, I knew it was there and it did impact the story enough, especially when it came to the princess persona that she was taking on to, to sort of fit into this high fantasy world. But on the other hand, it never held her back from anything either. She wasn't left out and she wasn't considered horrible or disfigured because she had a disability. It, it was, a I feel, a very, very good representation. Um, and that, especially, I think, in, in this day and age, is so hard to do. Much like um, the Asian representation, the Asian spiral world that I was talking about in Circle of Shadows, any sort of diversity rep, I think we're having sort of a growing pain in how we want it to be presented. We want it to be there, but a lot of times authors in their, I don't know if it's their need or their discomfort in representing, you know, different groups, um, that it's overdone or it's not done quite correctly enough. It isn't represented properly. Again, this is why own voices is so important. But that being said, this, this was amazing. This was a this was a four-star read for me. I don't really like Beauty and the Beast retellings, mostly because Beauty and the Beast was something that I watched over and over and over as a kid. Like, I wanted to be Belle so bad, um, but after I grew up, there was nothing for me in this in, in these stories. It was more just a nostalgia porn kind of thing. That said, I quite enjoy it. Um, I think that I will be reading the, the others in this series. Um, not immediately. I, I've heard mixed reviews of A Heart So Fierce and Broken, so I, I don't know how, how I feel about this. Tell me what, how you feel about it in the comments below. All right, and the last book that I read in October, which I, I don't know how I had time for this, but I did, I read Dollbones because uh, Jaded Reader had posted a video for uh, demon recommendations, and I'm like, yes, I love demons. So she's recommended Doll Bones, which is sort of the last one that she recommended. I, I really did enjoy this. I gave it four stars. It's a it's a middle grade. It's a middle grade creepy story that has a very good ending at the end. Um, ending at the end. This is a book that I wish had been around when I was in middle school so that I could like enjoy and love reading as much as I do now because I was a creepy kid. <laughs> <laughs> the, this was this was a creepy story for for creepy kids, and I I liked it. I I liked the dynamic between all the different characters. I liked that nobody's home was perfect and lovely. Like each had their own tribulation to sort of overcome. And I, I love the fact that because they're in middle school, they're coming out of childhood. So the the boy in particular who we follow, you know, very closely for most of this book, he has friends that are girls and his dad is expecting him to have friends that are boys. They play with dolls still, but they're coming into a point where it's not socially acceptable to play with dolls anymore. The story itself is about a porcelain doll or a, a bone china doll that is haunted and the kids are weirdly sent on a quest to go return the doll and bury her in the place where she died and of course you know th these are 13, 12 and 13 year old kids who don't quite know how to travel interstate and take buses and fend for themselves it's very fun they go on an amazing adventure was this a demon this was not a demon this this was a ghost this was a haunting but I, 
honestly, I, I don't even care. Like it, it was it was a great book. Do I recommend this? Absolutely. Like for middle schoolers, I think if they're creepy kids and they like to be a little bit scared and kept on the edge of their seat, I think this is a great book for that. For anyone older than the middle school age, I still think this is a great story. I think that you should pick it up if you want a little bit of childish adventure in your life. It, it made me smile. It made me worried for the kids. It definitely did have a very creepy atmosphere to it. So it was perfect in time for Halloween. Now into October, I read one book. <laughs> Honestly, I had, between the two flights, two flight journeys, I had about 48 hours of reading, which I did not do. I had three physical books, I bought three more, I had my Kindle loaded, I had Scribd, like, downloaded and everything, and I did not do this. I slept a lot. 24 hours of flying is no joke. It is stressful as hell. I read in October House of Salt and Sorrows, which was amazing. I gave it five stars. It apparently is a retelling of a fairy tale, which I don't know which one. It is a curse that has been laid upon this family and each daughter successively keeps dying. The, the house is cursed. I guess she's one, she's definitely one of the middle children, but she's technically now second in line to inherit the house and the family. She is trying desperately to figure out why the girls are cursed, what's haunting them, and how essentially to, to break the curse. There's of course a lot more to that. She falls in love. There's balls, there's dancing. It, it is a seafaring nation, which was really kind of neat and cool. It's done extremely well. I really liked it. And this wasn't a strong, strong female Male character type. All of the girls love very feminine things. They they look towards marriage. They love dancing. They love balls. They they love their lifestyle. And it, there's a very like old timey feel about it. However, the girl that we follow is very smart and thoughtful and clever, um, without having to be like physically strong and having to give up her, her very you know traditionally feminine loves. That was awesome. I I enjoyed this a lot. And again, when we're talking about representation, I feel like a lot of the strong female characters are not like other girls and have to be strong, as in physically strong. But this was a book that had a very traditionally feminine character while still being a fortified individual. Like, there was strength, but it didn't manifest in a way that had to be physical. I really enjoyed it. I loved it. I would recommend this to anyone, like literally anyone. Even if you are not a fan of fantasy, if you're not a fan of horror, uh, like, if you're not a fan of romance, it, like, it fit all these categories very neatly, but at the same time, it was, it broke the genres just enough where it was very enjoyable, but also very different at the same time. I, I really, I really liked it. I can't say much more than that. Please go read it if you haven't. That is my wrap up. Uh, I feel like I had a really, really good succession of books sort of at the back end of this thing rather than the front end. But I, I'm very happy with the things that I read. And I'm really happy with how many books I was I managed to read in September because that's not normal for me. And, and I did it. I finished all the prompts. I was very happy. I guess that's it. So thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below if you haven't already for content that will be better and shorter than this. I am so sorry this is going to be a forever long wrap up, but yeah, I need to catch up on things. If you like this video and if you like the things that I do, um, please share. I'm trying to grow this community for uh, things that will be happening in the future, so uh, stay tuned and hit the notification bell, please, that way, down below. So um, thank you again so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. All right, bye. She said it will never go away. I know there is nothing left to say Can we try to hold on just for now Even if we don't know how to show them what we're all about oh, oh.